So welcome back. So we're continuing on with our proof. So by the end of the previous video, I had just finished proving that the difference between the supremum of the limit function and the supremum of the function fn over any one of the subintervals of the partition, the modulus of that difference is always going to be less than or equal to epsilon over 4 times b minus a. So this inequality then holds true no matter which one of the subintervals you're talking about. And what we can now do is combine all of those inequalities together to conclude that the overall sum here is less than or equal to this. So we've got here, remember, the sum of each one of the lengths of the subintervals times this modulus, which we know is less than or equal to epsilon over 4 times b minus a. So overall, we can conclude that that great big sum is less than or equal to what you get if you sum up all the lengths of the subintervals, and instead of timesing them by the modulus of this difference of the supremums, you multiply instead by epsilon over 4 times b minus a. So this great big sum is less than or equal to the sum from i is equal to 1 to m of delta xi epsilon over 4 times b minus a. Now, this sum is very nice because actually, with respect to this sum, epsilon over 4 times b minus a is all just a constant, so that can come out the front. So we can rearrange this to it's equal to epsilon over 4 times b minus a times the sum from i is equal to 1 to m of the delta xi's, i.e., you sum up the length of all of the subintervals of the partition. But of course, if you sum up the length of every single one of the subintervals of the partition, you overall just get the length of the overall interval, which is just b minus a. And now you see why I put that divided by b minus a uh, when we chose the epsilon for the uniform convergence criterion up here because I was planning ahead so that it would cancel here. So this is b minus a, which cancels with that b minus a. So overall, this just comes out as equal to epsilon over 4. Now, why did I want epsilon over 4? Because if you remember, I know that this thing is less than epsilon over 2. Now I've just shown that this thing is less than epsilon or less than or equal to epsilon over 4. And I'm now going to show that this thing also comes out as less than or equal to epsilon over 4. So that I'm overall a overall able to conclude that this whole thing is strictly less than epsilon, which is what I need to do, because if you remember, this uh, is greater than or equal to um, this thing here, which is equal to this, which is what I'm really, really interested in. So coming back then, if you remember, what we did here is we started with the modulus of the difference between the upper sum of the limit function and the upper sum of the function fn, and we showed that this is less than or equal to this thing, which is less than or equal to overall epsilon over 4 is what we've got out here. So overall, we can now conclude that the modulus of this difference is less than or equal to epsilon over 4. So I've written that in here. I know now that the modulus of this difference is less than or equal to epsilon over 4, and that's that bit here. And as I was saying earlier, this difference is equal to the modulus of that difference, uh, so I know that this bit is less than epsilon over 2. So now what my tension needs to go onto this bit here. So what we're going to do here for this is going to be almost identical to what we did up here for this difference of upper sums, just with a few major but simple tweaks. So again, we'll start by getting rid of the modular signs initially and just thinking about the difference between these two lower sums. So the lower sum of fn minus the lower sum of f, the limit function, over this partition p. And again, we can write this out as uh, a sum. So the sum over all of the subintervals of the partition, so sum from i is equal to 1 to m, and again you need the length of the each of the subintervals here, so delta xi, and now of course it's going to be times the difference of the infimums of the functions that we're considering the difference of the lower sums for. So infimum, and you'll notice this time we've got it the other way around, so we've got the, the, it, the lower sum of fn minus the lower sum of f, rather than this way it was the upper sum of f minus the upper sum of fn. So it's going to be times the infimum of the function f big n over the ith subinterval minus the infimum of the function f over that ith subinterval. And again, what we can now do is replace the modular signs and then apply the triangle inequality m times to conclude that the modulus of this difference is now not equal to, but less than or equal to, 
the sum from i is equal to 1 to m of all of the moduluses. And again, we've pulled out the delta xi from the modulus because uh, it's a positive number, so we can do that. So sum from i is equal to 1 to m of delta xi times the modulus of the difference of the infimum of the function fm, or fn, sorry, and the function f over the um, subinterval, the i subinterval. And now, by the same argument as we saw up here, I'm able to conclude that for each one of these subintervals, the modulus of the difference of these infimums is always going to be less than or equal to epsilon over 4 times b minus a. Now, I'm not going to go through the full argument again. Instead, I'm just going to show you again the intuitive reason that that is true. So here is my i subinterval here from xi minus 1 to xi. In white, this is supposed to represent the limit function f. Blue here is the epsilon over 4 times b minus a interval around the limit function f. And then we know fn is contained within that blue tube. So it's always a distance away from the limit function less than epsilon over 4 times b minus a. And then the intuitive reason that this the maximum it can possibly be is epsilon over 4 times b minus a, is that, you know, this red function and white function, the distance apart that they are, is always strictly less than this. So how can they possibly end up then with infimums that are further than this apart? And the answer is, of course, they can't. They can end up with infimums that are equal to this value apart. And that's because even though they can never actually obtain uh, values that far apart. Infimums and supremums don't, are not the same as maximums and minimums. You don't actually have to obtain those values in order for it to be called an infimum. And that's the sort of counterexample I gave you earlier when we were discussing supremums. We were discussing the same sort of problem but with supremums, where we had that uh, function fn that was getting closer and closer to being uh, epsilon over 4 times b minus a away from the function f, but never actually obtained that value at the point where it would have obtained that value. I set it so it would go back down to being equal to f, uh, but that still meant that the supremum of that fn uh, was equal to epsilon over 4 times b minus a away from the supremum of the limit function f. And a similar example could be constructed for the infimum version. So as I say, I'm not going to prove this inequality. You can do that for yourself by contradiction, the exact same method as we used for the supremum case. Uh, but I hope that you understand intuitively why this is true, why over any one of these subintervals, the difference between the two infimums is bounded in how big it can be because of the fact that the difference between the two functions anywhere on the subinterval is bounded in how far it can be. In particular, it can never be um, greater than or equal to this value. It must always be less than this value. And then the important understanding point is that it doesn't remain strictly less than when we consider the difference between the two infimums uh, because of the fact that infimums are not minimums. And in order to have a certain infimum, you don't actually have to obtain that infimum. It doesn't have to be a minimum. So you can actually end up with examples where the two infimums end up exactly this value apart, which is the sort of counterexample I gave you uh, when we were discussing the supremum case. So that, as I say, I think is one of the trickiest parts of understanding this proof, uh, understanding this inequality and the equivalent inequality for supremums, that you no longer have the strictly less than you have less than or equal to. So continuing on now, because we know each one of these things is less than or equal to this value, then we can conclude that the entire sum here is less than or equal to um, what you'd get if you replace this with this value. Now, because this is a constant, again, we can pull it out. So it's less than or equal to epsilon divided by 4 times b minus a times the sum from i is equal to 1 to m of delta xi. And again, we're just summing up the lengths of all of the subintervals of the partition here, which will overall give us the length of the whole interval, which is b minus a, and that will therefore cancel with this b minus a. So we'll again get that this is epsilon over 4. So I've written that in here, this is equal to epsilon over 4, and working our way back, this was less than or equal to this, this 
was less than or equal to this, which is equal to epsilon over 4. So we can therefore overall, co co overall conclude that this thing is less than or equal to epsilon over 4. And now we're done, because look at this thing that we were trying to bound. I know this thing is less than or equal to epsilon over 4. I know this thing now is less than or equal to epsilon over 4, and I know that this thing is strictly less than epsilon over 2. So when I add them all together now, I can conclude that it's strictly less than epsilon. I can conclude that it's strictly less than epsilon because this middle bit is strictly less than epsilon over 2. If it was less than or equal to epsilon over 2, I wouldn't be able to conclude that it was strictly less than epsilon because I'd have less than or equal to all for all three of them. But because I've got strictly less than, in the case of this one, uh, I can conclude that overall this is strictly less than epsilon. And now remember where this came from again. So we were considering the difference between the upper Riemann sum for our limit function over this partition and the lower Riemann sum for our limit function over this partition. And we said that it's equal to the modulus of that difference and that the modulus of that difference was equal to this complicated thing where we subtracted and then added back on the same thing twice. Uh, and then we used the triangle inequality on that to say that that was less than or equal to this thing, which we've now shown is strictly less than epsilon. So we can conclude that this difference, the modulus of this difference, is strictly less than epsilon. And as that modulus of that difference was equal to the unmodulus difference, we can conclude that this is strictly less than epsilon, which is what we needed to do. So let's zoom back out now and summarise what we've overall done here. So remember, we were trying to prove that the uniform limit of a sequence of integrable functions is also integrable. So we attempted to do this by proving the Riemann integrability criterion. So we took an epsilon greater than zero, and we wanted to show that there exists a partition such that the difference between the upper and lower sum for a uniform limit function f over that partition is less than epsilon. So what we then did is we used the uniform convergence criterion to say that we could find a function f big n such that it is always within epsilon over 4 times b minus a distance of the uniform limit function f. And we then said this function f big n is integrable, therefore it obeys the integrability criterion, therefore I can find a partition such that the difference between the upper and lower sums for the function f big n over that partition is less than epsilon over 2. And then I claim that this partition works if I then consider the difference between the upper and lower sums for my uniform limit function over that same partition, it will be less than epsilon. And that's what I've then done. So I took this difference and to show that it's less than epsilon, I said it's equal to the modulus of the difference because it's a non-negative number. And then I did this fancy trick and then applied the triangle inequality to that to say that it's therefore less than or equal to these three things added together. And then I've convinced you that these two things are less than or equal to epsilon over 4. And this one we know already is strictly less than epsilon over 2. And ergo, I can conclude that this will be strictly less than epsilon. And hence, I've shown that a partition does exist such that this is true. And you can do this whatever epsilon you take that is greater than zero. Hence, the integrability criterion is satisfied for our uniform limit function f, and we can conclude that f is Riemann integrable. We'll have a break there, and then in the next video, I will show you that the integral of the uniform limit is equal to the limit of the integrals of the functions in the sequence of functions.